Welcome everyone to our educational event, Public Rights in Milwaukee's Fresh Coast. I'm Melissa Scanlon, a professor in the School of Freshwater Sciences and the director of the Center for Water Policy. Our center's mission is to connect the best research in water science and economics to inform policy that protects, restores, and conserves freshwater. And one way we do that is by convening educational events like this one. Milwaukee's fresh coast is a gem to those who have experienced it. It's often overlooked, uh, but much of the city's coastline and riverfronts are not original. They're built on lake bed or riverbed that's been filled to create new land. The lake bed is held in trust by the state for public uses. So these areas of filled lake bed raise questions about what is public enough to satisfy the public trust doctrine. Can the state and other developers exclude the public? What are the permissible uses of the newly created land? Today, we're gonna to hear from six speakers who bring a variety of perspectives to the discussion. Uh, we will hear from them and then we'll have a Q&A. So please post your questions in the Q&A box and we'll discuss as many as possible after hearing from the speakers. For the lawyers attending, this program has been approved uh, for 1.5 hours of CLE credit, just in time for your reporting deadline. Okay, I'm gonna introduce the panelists now. John Gerda is a Milwaukee-born writer and historian who has been studying his hometown since 1972. He's the author of 22 books, including histories of Milwaukee area neighborhoods, industries and places of worship. Gerda's most ambitious efforts are the Making of Milwaukee, the first full-length history of the community published since 1948, and Milwaukee, City of Neighborhoods, a geographic companion that has quickly become the standard work on grassroots Milwaukee. The common thread in all of Gerda's work is an understanding of history as why things are the way they are. Brenda Coley is the co-executive director of Milwaukee Water Commons. Over the years, she has served in a variety of positions in the nonprofit and academic sectors and brings a longstanding commitment to social justice and community organizing. Coley is committed to exploring the influences of one's culture and understanding ways in which groups of people are treated in society, using that knowledge to develop strategies to effectively engage diverse groups of people in important community issues. Michael Kane is co-chair of the Public Trust and Wetlands Work Group he received, uh, for, for Wisconsin's Green Fire. He received his JD from UW-Madison and was the lead attorney for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources Wetland and Surface Water Regulatory Program for 34 years. He retired in 2009. He was involved in drafting and developing laws protecting Wisconsin's waters under the public trust doctrine and was the lead attorney for enforcement and litigation of these programs. He successfully led the DNR through hundreds of permit and enforcement cases. Michael Kolakowski is also now at the DNR um, having filled in after Michael Kane left. Michael Kolakowski received his JD from UW-Madison. He is, um, he's always been interested in environmental law and preservation. In his current role, he's in the Bureau of Law Enforcement and Parks and Recreation. And he provides counsel on natural resource management and environmental protection broadly. Tony Herkert serves as the Government Affairs Director with the League of Wisconsin Municipalities. Before joining the league, she served as policy analyst and clerk at the Senate Committee on Natural Resources and Energy. She's an expert on issues related to water regulation, including permitting and zoning. She has also previously worked at the DNR, Wisconsin Lakes, and New Water in Green Bay. Sarah Martinez is a water policy specialist at the Center for Water Policy in the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences. Her position also involves being a Sea Grant UW Water Science Policy Fellow. She received her JD from the University of Utah SJ Coiney College of Law in 2021 
and has been enjoying exploring Milwaukee ever since. Um, so we have a great lineup here and we're gonna start with our first panelist, John Gerda, uh, writer and historian. He's going to chronicle the major stages of development in Milwaukee's coastline development, beginning with the land, first landfilling activity, the breakwater impacts and the creation of Lincoln Memorial Drive. Uh, John, why don't you take it away? Thank you, Melissa, and welcome everyone. Uh, my job is to in 10 minutes to tell you the history of Milwaukee's lakefront, uh, which would be something of a challenge. Uh, when people in Milwaukee talk about going to the lakefront, they often mean Lincoln Memorial Drive, uh, some stretch along it, uh, because that is the most public and the most cherished public space, probably in Milwaukee, maybe in the, a larger region. Uh, so I'll concentrate on that lakefront, but also talk about uh, what has gone on over the decades uh, farther south as well. So I will turn my camera off and we will turn the slides on. Uh, Marilyn will uh, advance those. Uh, the first rule of thumb you have to know about the lakefront in Milwaukee is that anything that's flat was once underwater. You know, that's true almost without exception. And what we present to the lake side of uh, looking east is kind of a rampart of glacial ridges uh, that were deposited by a retreating lobe of the Lake Michigan Glacier with one exception, and that is where the Milwaukee River punches through uh, that rampart to reach Lake Michigan. And that river mouth is why Milwaukee exists. It created the best natural harbor on the western shore of the lake, uh, which is why Milwaukee became a major city, even in the deep shade of Chicago. But what that meant in terms of topography was you have high waves meeting steep bluffs, which meant you had a huge erosion problem. You go back to the previous slide, Marilyn, uh, that is the North Point Lighthouse that was built back in 1855, and it was mercilessly attacked by those waves. So next slide. They actually had to move it, uh, build a new one as the old one tumbled into the lake, build a new one 100 feet west, which is where the uh, lighthouse, North Point Lighthouse is today. So next slide. The first protection against uh, the turmoil of the lake was actually a railroad. And this is just a wonderful photograph uh, where you see the locomotive here. That is the Oak Leaf Trail. If you've ever biked in Milwaukee, that is the trail upon which you rise from Milwaukee up through uh, the ravine uh, going through Lafayette up around the Urban Ecology Center and on into uh, actually going up into Ozaukee and Sheboygan counties. What was going on then was you had two rival railroads, the Milwaukee Road from Milwaukee, Chicago Northwestern from Chicago, and they were kind of proxies in the rivalry between those two cities. The Milwaukee Road would not let the Northwestern enter the city on its tracks, so the Northwestern decided to go along the lakeshore. It was vulnerable, but it was cheap, um, amazingly, back in those years. So back in 1873, uh, they enlarged a ravine around Lafayette Place and used that fill to put in what you see here, kind of this sloping right away heading down to the Northwestern Depot you see in the far left in the haze there and on into Chicago, uh, the North Chicago Northwestern right away. And there was another development there on the left. This is one of the first public uses of the lakefront. Uh, this is the North Point Flushing Station, which was built back in 1888 uh, to flush the Putrid River with fresh water from Lake Michigan. But what it meant if the railroad here uh, is that for roughly 50 years, Milwaukee was effectively blocked from access to the lake. It was the railroad, it took your life in your hands, got as busy as trains were back in those days trying to get to the lake. So next slide. This is the North Point Flushing Station. You can see the rail right away just on the left there. Uh, and this is the, the inlet uh, that they used to uh, push the lake water in uh, to an outfall just below the North Avenue Dam. You may recognize this as Collectivo Coffee today. So this is still very much in business. Next slide. So you have that little pad of made land at the foot of the bluff, and there was one more uh, kind of equivalent size a bit farther north at the foot of North Avenue. This is the Milwaukee Waterworks that was installed back in 1873. Of course, it had to be on the lake because that's where the water comes from. The North Point Water Tower you see up on the bluff there. Uh, so you have these small pads of made land, as they called it, and there was public access on, on both of those sites, which kind of whetted the public's appetite for more, more certainly a devoted public land to appreciate and approach our most important resource. And next slide. 
But first of all, you had to protect the shoreline from that continued erosion that had been such a problem uh, from the, the early days of urban settlement. So work on the breakwater began back in 1881. And the first section, which was about 3,500 feet, was done back in 1892, oriented toward the northeast, because that is where the most destructive storms came from. And as you can see, the uh, the patricians up there on the bluff, you know, the large homes and the North Point water tower as well. So it was uh, obviously a good fishing spot. These guys are probably going after perch with cane poles. And by 1925, almost two miles had been finished and the harbor was basically enclosed. Next slide. One result of that breakwater was the longshore currents here run from north to south, and those were interrupted by the break wall, which meant the sand was deposited on the north side of that structure. That created McKinley Beach, and this was the first beach on the urban shoreline in Milwaukee, and gave the Milwaukee Yacht Club enough confidence to build their own clubhouse, which you see on the right here, uh, built back in 1896. Next slide. So a lake drive was now possible, uh, but it took a long time uh, to gather momentum. What really was kind of a breakthrough there was the socialists being elected uh, Milwaukee's governors back in 1910, the, the clean sweep of city offices and county as well. So a man named Charlie Whitnell, Charles B. Whitnell was kind of the godfather of the park movement and his philosophy really stressed uh, waterways, parks on waterways. So landfill began in earnest. And as you can see, these are our cinders still smoking from the incinerator. They weren't too picky about what they used for fill. Next slide. And here you see the railroad right away still existing there in the foreground. And there's the Juno Park Lagoon, uh, kind of in the upper part of the photograph, which was not dredged or dug, but actually enclosed part of the lake that was enclosed. And next slide. And here's a view from the other direction, uh, roughly from where the War Memorial Center is today. And you can see how that rather unsettled uh, landfill there was in, in place for a, a very long time. Okay, next slide. So the plan was to keep that drive going farther north, uh, all the way up to what is now uh, Kenwood. One obstacle was the patricians who had their large, large homes on Terrace Avenue and Lake Drive, uh, Wall Avenue. And this is the home of Gustav Pabst, who ran the Pabst Brewery, as you can imagine. And their landlines went all the way down to the lake. So they resisted for a time, but they realized finally that they would be protected from erosion. So in a case of enlightened self-interest in 1927, they all signed off on easements and the drive continued. Okay, next slide. One result was, as that landfill continued, was Bradford Beach, which became the largest of the Lincoln Memorial Drive beaches and certainly the summertime playground for Milwaukeeans by the tens of thousands as it remains today. Next slide. And you have, as that landfill continues, development continues, you've got Lincoln Memorial Drive opens in 1929. Here you see it going facing south toward the Northwestern Depot. And this became uh, three miles of some of the most gorgeous shoreline on the entire Great Lakes. This is something Milwaukee has done well and doesn't pat ourselves on the back. We don't pat ourselves on the back often enough for the, what we've done to preserve our lakefront for public use. So next slide. Going south along the lakeshore, this is hard to place today, but if you were at the War Memorial Center, uh, this would be looking south down to the river mouth. And this would include, <laughs> include the, the Calatrava, uh, Lakeshore State Park, the Summerfest grounds all the way down to the river mouth. So you can see this landfill was an absolutely blank canvas. You know, this was just awaiting a development. And early on in the teens, it was slated to become part of the Port of Milwaukee development. Next slide. What happened instead was there was a change in thinking and the rise of a new transportation medium, which was aviation. And no city was worth its salt unless it had a downtown airport. So Maitland Field was put on Milwaukee's lakefront back in 1927. And you can see this is right on the site of uh, what became the Milwaukee World Festival grounds. And it kind of plotted along until the 1950s. This lasted for a very long time and didn't make anybody any money. Hey, next slide. And in the 1950s, that same site was commandeered by the US Army for a Nike anti-aircraft missile site. And this lasted, it was operational back in 56, and it lasted for more than the next decade until this was made obsolete by 
intercontinental missiles. Hey, next slide. And what happened finally uh, is that in 1970, it became the home of Summerfest. So it found its highest and best use as the home of the world's largest music festival. Okay, next slide. You cross that river mouth on the lakefront and you're in a different section of the lakefront entirely. This is Jones Island, which was never an island, always a peninsula. Uh, this is one of the most fascinating pieces of real estate in Wisconsin. Uh, it was for many years, uh, the site of a, an immigrant fishing village dominated by fisher folk from the Baltic Sea coast of Poland, a group called the Kashubes. By 1900, there were roughly 1,600 people living on Jones Island, and they brought up 2 million pounds of fish in an average year. So this is the origin of the fish fry and a source of protein for generations of Milwaukeeans. Next slide. It was condemned by the city in 1914, and Jones Island was remade as the site of both the port facilities and the sewage treatment plant. Still very much there, obviously, and this was opened in 1925 and a pioneer in the use of the activated sludge method. Uh, my project for this year is a PBS documentary about Jones Island's fascinating history. Uh, currently in the process of raising funds for it, so if you'd like to see proposals, I'd be happy to share one with you. Okay, next and last slide. This is the Milwaukee Iron Company, uh, just on the south end of Jones Island. It opened back in 1868 and put Bayview on the map as a company town built around this mill, which employed roughly 1,600 people at the peak back in the 1870s, so a huge employer. And what it did was it set the tone for the development of Milwaukee's South Lakefront as a series of industrial suburbs. First, St. Francis, you have this lake, lake, lakeside power plant there back in 1921. Uh, then Cudahy, Patrick Cudahy Meatpacking opens there back in 1895, South Milwaukee, uh, Bucyrus Erie, 1892, and then on down into Oak Creek. You got that huge Oak Creek power plant opening back in the 1950s. So the theme there is smokestacks on the lakefront from Bayview all the way down to the county line. A sharp contrast to what you find north of downtown. And that, in a nutshell, is the story of Milwaukee's lakefront. Thank you, John. That was terrific. Um, I believe Brenda Coley must be having technical problems, so she's not with us at this point. We're going to skip to the next speaker, um, Michael Kane. He is a board member and co-chair of the Public Trust and Wetlands Work Group at Wisconsin's Green Fire, and a retired Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources attorney is going to discuss issues with lake bed fill that never rose to the level of litigation. Uh, the DNR's history in dealing with lake bed fill as well as noteworthy areas built on fill. Uh, Michael, please take it away. Well, thank you, Melissa. Um, Greenfire is happy to be a co-sponsor of uh, today's session. Um, Greenfire got involved in this um, when it came to our attention back in 2020 that there were some proposals to commercialize uh, some of Milwaukee's lakefront, uh, Bradford Beach, um, the Roundhouse, and South Shore Terrace. And we um, helped put together a joint letter uh, with a number of groups, including the Midwest Environmental Advocates, uh, Water Commons, Milwaukee Water Commons, uh, Preserve Our Parks, and Milwaukee Riverkeeper to the Milwaukee County officials and to state officials. Uh, because of our concern, um, we wanted to be sure that these, uh, these lands were not commercialized and were, uh, were kept open. Next slide, please. Um, I've got a narrative that I put together, uh, which is uh, runs to about 30 pages with attachments uh, that will be available on the Greenfire website and hopefully will be available on the UWM website when we're done with this, uh, that describes in more detail um, a lot of the issues that we're discussing today and contains an article, um, it contains the joint letter that we sent with the other groups and organizations. Uh, contains some DNR documents and also contains an article from Shepherd Express that talks about some of the issues on, on the, um, the waterfront. And um, we are concerned about both the public trust issues and social justice issues because, um, as John Goethe pointed out, um, you know, this is a, um, a tremendous um, asset uh, both to the state of Wisconsin and the city of Milwaukee. Um, I've been working on these issues the for about 50 years, um, and I, um, in that experience, I want to talk about some of the things I've dealt with in Milwaukee and also some of the things that I've dealt with uh, elsewhere around the state. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the public trust doctrine emanates from um, Wisconsin Constitution, Article 9, Section 1. There's a sizable body of common law, um, which uh, holds that all of these navigable waters and the lands beneath them are held in trust uh, by the state for the public. Um, and the state has an affirmative duty to protect and preserve these public trust waters. Um, next slide. Uh, Wisconsin's been a state for about 174 years, and um, these issues of potential commercialization of, of lake bed and riverbed is not new. Um, the, uh, there was a case that went to the Wisconsin Supreme Court in 1899 called Prewe and Wisconsin Land Improvement versus Wisconsin Land and Improvement Company. But this dealt with a proposal um, in Big Muskego Lake in Waukesha County, um, where the legislature granted the Wisconsin Land Improvement Company authority to drain the lake and to use um, you know, the, the land for agriculture and development purposes. Went to the Supreme Court in 1899. The Supreme Court said the legislature has no authority to emancipate itself from its public trust obligation, um, no more authority than it does to donate the school fund or the state capital to a private purpose. Next slide, please. Um, another seminal case dealing with the trust doctrine is state versus public service commission. This dealt with um, a, an issue in Lake Wingra, could you click again, um, where, um, where there was fill place in Lake Wingra to create Vilas Park. And the Supreme Court said that this was permissible because public bodies controlled it. Next, click again. Um, it was devoted to a public trust purpose and open to the public, and click again. And there was a minimal area relative to the waterway that was impacted. Um, next slide. Uh, some of the things that we've dealt with around the state, um, there, there seems to be an insatiable appetite, not surprisingly, um, for private and commercial um, development on these properties, on the on lake bed and river bed. Uh, state versus Trudeau is a case I was involved with, went to the Supreme Court in 1987, where two condominium buildings were placed on the bed of Lake Superior at Madeline Island. Um, after years of litigation, uh, they were removed after the Supreme Court found that they were clearly in violation of the trust doctrine. Next slide. Uh, this is one of the three unit buildings built on pilings um, over wetlands, which are adjacent to Lake Superior and on the bed of a lake. Next slide. And this is what happened when the Supreme Court uh, finally ruled that this was a violation of the public trust. Next slide. Um, during the course of my career, um, I dealt with commercial and residential proposals um, all around the state. These are just some of the cities um, that were involved in, in various um, proposals. Um, probably approximately one per month for the 34 years that I was at the Department of Natural Resources, um, these sorts of developments ran across my desk and, uh, and we and department staff, myself and department staff got involved with them. Next slide. Um, I'll talk a little bit about lake bed grant issues. Um, you know it through John Gerda's slides how all of that waterfront in Milwaukee was filled. It was filled on public trust lake bed. And the, uh, the state of Wisconsin holds that, that lake bed in trust. It cannot be alienated or given to a private party. Um, so some of the issues that we dealt with were, you know, what is an acceptable public trust use? How do we assure that the project is public and, and not commercial? I'll talk a little bit about some of the Milwaukee developments I dealt with, and also some of the lake bed development proposals in Ashland, Kenosha, Sturgeon Bay. And last year, um, Green Fire was involved in a proposal in Racine. There was a proposal to build a, a hotel and restaurant on lake bed in Racine. Uh, we and other groups opposed it, and that was ultimately withdrawn. Um, so next slide. Um, I've dealt with the, uh, the Summerfest grounds. Um, I actually attended Summerfest in its early years when they had that tent that John showed. Um, and um, when I worked with the Department of Natural Resources, um, we dealt with Summerfest because there was a proposal there to put permanent restaurants and bars on that lake bed fill. Um, we determined, the state determined, uh, following Supreme Court guidance, that um, the public um, you know, recreational facility was acceptable. But um, you know that putting permanent bars and restaurants out there was not. Um, one of the issues that came up over time was during the festival season. Um, you know, could the public still you know, move along the, the lakeshore? And Lakeshore State Park was built out there. When they were build, digging the deep tunnel, um, the Lakeshore State Park materials were placed out there, and that actually provided 
um, a means for the public to continue to move along the shoreline, um, even during those periods of time when uh, the festivals um, were occurring. Next slide. Um, when the Milwaukee Art Museum put together the Calatrava um, extension or of, of that, one of the first things I proposed was to have a fancy sit-down restaurant um, at the Calatrava. Uh, we advised them that that was not acceptable because it was not, it was a commercialization of the lake bed, but they could have a food service um, that was appropriate for a museum. And um, we have some guidelines that were put together. There's, those are attached to my narrative. Next slide. Um, up in Ashland, there was an 1800 foot ore dock that went out into the lake. It covered four acres of lake bed. When it was abandoned for purposes of, of moving ore, there was a proposal to put a hotel and condominiums um, at, at that location. Um, the state of Wisconsin um, opposed that. The superstructure has now been removed, and this is a fishing pier and public park, which is an appropriate public trust use. Next slide. Um, up in Sturgeon Bay, there was actually a proposal to cantilever condos um, over uh, open water uh, from filled lake bed, and, um, and this, this was ultimately withdrawn. Next slide. One of the more audacious proposals uh, came across my desk when I was nearing retirement. Um, dealt with um, a gulf and residential development uh, south of Port Washington, where there was a proposal to push 56 acres of fill into the lake uh, to develop a, a golf course um, development. So this is an example of, of some of the sorts of things we see, we've seen. Next slide. So the key points I want to leave you with is there, there are limited mechanisms to allow public trust uses on Lake Bed. No entity, including the legislature, can authorize uses which abdicate the public trust. Uh, lake bed areas, even after they are filled, remain public lake beds subject to the trust doctrine. And due to the high monetary value of these lands, um, there's always a desire to develop them commercially. Next slide. This discusses just some of the things that are attached to my narrative. Um, next slide. We've also dealt with issues relating to riverbeds around the state. Um, Milwaukee came to us when they cleaned up the river and wanted to put permanent barges and um, in the river and put bars and restaurants on them. We told them that was not acceptable on public trust riverbed. And we worked with the city of Milwaukee to develop, develop Riverlink guidelines, which gave rise to the Riverlink that, that exists there today. So I'll end there. Um, please look at the narrative that's gonna be available on our um, Wisconsin Green Fire website. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Kane. Uh, next up is our second Michael on the panel, Michael Kolakowski. He's an attorney at the DNR today, and he's going to discuss current policy issues around Lake Bedfill. Uh, Michael, you can take it away. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you for everyone for tuning in. My name is Michael Kolakowski, currently a staff attorney with Wisconsin DNR. My role at DNR is to provide counsel and uh, to represent in litigation our waterways and wetlands program. The same role that Michael Kane uh, played as my predecessor for many years. And in that program, uh, you deal substantially with the public trust as it relates to uh, privatization of uh, structures uh, in the waterways, uh, waterway modifications, public use of areas. That is really the shop where the public trust lives within DNR. And I want to share with you a little bit about what DNR's role is with regards to the waterways and the implementation of the public trust. Uh, talk about a few discrete examples in Milwaukee and elsewhere that really get at uh, the issue of the public's use, the open public use of uh, our waterfronts and tell you a little bit about uh, current challenges uh, that are occurring in Milwaukee and elsewhere and what we expect to see in the future. So next slide, please. <clears throat> So the DNR uh, has been delegated by the legislature substantial authority in regards to implementation of the public trust doctrine in Wisconsin. And, and that's accomplished in a number of ways. The first one is regulatory. So Wisconsin DNR is responsible for chapter 30, which is uh, navigable waters protection law, permitting for any modifications to waterways. And that could be anything from removing material from the bed of waterways to the placement of structures on the bed of waterways. Um, and as part of that review, the department's got to make a determination of whether the proposed project um, is not detrimental to the public interest. We're uh, there looking at making sure that the public's interest in navigable waters is protected. And the elements of that decision uh, get at all of the elements of the public trust. 
fish and wildlife habitat, public recreation, water quality. <clears throat> so we've got to make those anytime we've got an activity really that, that touches navigable waters. We're also involved with water quality certification. And this is a situation where if the department does not have a permit for a particular activity, uh, but there is still a federal permit, the department's got to determine that uh, the state's water quality standards are met. And embedded in our water quality certification administrative rules is a judgment that the public trust as it relates to water quality is gonna be upheld by a particular project that we're signing off on. Uh, no project that needs a federal approval can move forward until we've provided that service certification. Um, relevant to Milwaukee and uh, other areas uh, throughout the state that have harbor mouths particularly, our remediation and redevelopment program is also very heavily involved. Um, as you can tell uh, a little bit from John Gerda's presentation, a lot of our harbors uh, and our, our rivers in the major cities on the Great Lakes developed around heavy industrial uses. Um, and that's consistent. You see that pretty well throughout the country. And so you end up with a lot of uh, contamination and cleanup issues. Our remediation and redevelopment program uh, gets engaged essentially when uh, there is a proposal to bring a property around uh, back to back to a use uh, in present day and make sure that the uh, contamination is appropriately dealt with. We also have an enforcement role. Uh, we are the uh, state agency responsible for enforcement of the public trust, and that includes uh, the terms of lake bed grants, which we've talked a little bit about and we'll talk more about shortly. Um, and we also have the responsibility to make sure that there's not infringements on the public trust uh, through uh, privatization of public waters. DNR is the first agency responsible for that. And we work hand in hand with the Department of Justice, uh, who is our enforcement arm when we need to refer to the Department of Justice for prosecution for these types of enforcement matters. We also play an informational role. When it comes to lake bed grants, the creation of new lake bed grants or the uh, amendments of the, the terms of lake bed grants given to municipalities, uh, the, the department is required to create a legislative report to go to, to go along with any legislation that's proposed, uh, which is to determine if the uh, legislation appropriately protects public trust uses of the lake bed grant area. Next slide, please. So uh, in more general terms, you know, our, our responsibility is preservation of the public's rights and interests uh, as delegated responsibility for the public trust doctrine. Uh, as Michael Kane said, we've got an active duty to preserve and promote the public interest in navigable waters. And we do that through continuity. As Michael Kane uh, talked about in, in his presentation, you've got a long history of the department protecting the public's use of areas that are constitutionally required to remain um, open to the public and uh, not private. Um, not taken out of that public domain. So we look to maintain continuity, um, not just across you know, a single property, but statewide. Uh, the importance of the public trust uh, is that it protects waterways throughout the state, not just in Milwaukee. And so we maintain the continuity of that public protection throughout the state. Uh, one of the ways we do that in Milwaukee is by participating in the Lakefront Development Advisory Committee. Uh, this is a committee that has... Um, a weigh in on significant proposals that would affect the lakefront. And uh, Milwaukee, uh, excuse me, uh, the DNR has got a, a seat, a uh, non voting seat on that development advisory committee. And we engage uh, with city officials um, to make sure that the public areas within Milwaukee remain public and are used for appropriate purposes. And when we look at the future of the department's role, it's going to be, you know, continuing our, our preservation and the continuity that we brought to uh, the public trust implementation in the state. But we also need to have a proactive role in order to maintain uh, an appropriate um, protection. We've got to be involved in the community. We've got to have community engagement. As you see the challenges uh, that municipalities will face in the coming years, uh, we've got to be a, a willing partner in terms of how to uh, best preserve and promote the public trust in these communities. Next slide, please. So I'll talk just real briefly about a couple of examples. Uh, one uh, on continuity is the Harbor House Lake Bed Grant in uh, the city of Milwaukee. Next slide, please. Harbor House, for those of you who have been there, is the former Pieces of Eight restaurant and sits on a lake bed grant from the state to uh, the city of Milwaukee. Next grant, please. Right, next slide. 
So the legislative lake bed grants, uh, all of these lake bed grants come with terms that make sure that the grants to the municipality is consistent with the constitutional obligation uh, to protect the public trust in those areas. So the grant to the city of Milwaukee in 1929 was conditioned that the use of that area had to be an aid of navigation in the fisheries. And this is a standard type of condition in these grants. You'll see throughout the state that uh, we'll talk about aid of navigation, public recreation, public parks. Those are the purposes for which these grants are made. Uh, now, the Board of Harbor Commissioners, who's responsible for grants in the area, leased this grant area to specialty restaurants in 1967, and Pieces of Eight was created. Next slide. And in 1987, DNR actually asked the Attorney General for a, an opinion specific to the Pieces of Eight restaurant. The Attorney General opined that it wasn't lawfully constructed in the first place. It's not a permissible public use to have a private restaurant on that late bed grant area, and that new additions would be unlawful as well. However, in 1987, when he wrote the opinion, the Pieces of Eight restaurant had been out there for some 20 years, um, and the state had never taken a uh, enforcement stance that uh, it was an unlawful use, and so it wouldn't be equitable at that time to seek to tear down the restaurant and, and get it off that public space. Next slide. Uh, Michael Kane talked about the cases uh, in the Supreme Court that, that get at the uh, aspects of the constitutionality of lake bed grants. You'll see public bodies control, open to the public, developed for a public purpose. Clearly a private restaurant sitting on a lake bed grant is not that. Next slide, please. Some history of the uh, lake bed grants in 1993, uh, the matter was referred to DOJ and as part of the settlements out of uh, that enforcement case, um, reached some conditions with the restaurant operator to make sure that uh, percentage of the patio was open to the public and that there was signage indicating the same. And from 1996 to about 2009, there were various proposals to expand that restaurant. Um, it's a, just a fantastic location for any of you who have been there and any restaurant tour would definitely want to capitalize on that. Um, so in 2010, Pieces of Eight was actually torn down to the studs and completely rebuilt and opened as the Harbor House. Next slide. And what happened in uh, subsequent years was the, uh, the proprietors there came to the department and asked if you know, we could look at softening our stance and considering the uh, Harbor House restaurant to essentially be an ancillary service to Discovery World, it's, it's neighbor next door, in the same way that there is a uh, food service area within the art museum. And DNR's response to that was the restaurant, Harbor House, remains an inconsistent use with the lake bed grant and with the public trust, but that continued enforcement discretion would be applied if the public amenities were maintained. And that's our continuity. We often see issues come back around. And the reason for that is when we've got a focus on preservation, um, as years pass, as faces change, you get the same or slightly modified questions coming uh, on the same exact projects. And so we maintain that continuity over, over years, over decades, to make sure that the public's rights are protected. Next slide, please. One of the, um, uh, I guess, more recent uh, challenges that we see is uh, public entities, municipalities primarily, uh, having issues with uh, fiscal, uh, how to say, <laughs> having issues with uh, public park land in these prime locations not being part of the tax base and how to maintain those, how to uh, capitalize and make sure that there is an appropriate uh, revenue generating component within the city. They start to look at these lake bed grant areas because they're so attractive. Uh, I'm getting a time warning. And so I'll just uh, note here that Racine had pro uh, proposed a modification to its lake bed grants. Next slide. Next slide, please. Uh, all those grants are real similar to the ones that you'll see in Milwaukee uh, for the purposes of a public park held in perpetuity for that purpose. And we're seen and proposed to build hotels and other private uses on that grant area. Uh, the legislature uh, was required obviously to create a law to do that. And DNR then was triggered to write a report uh, on the, um, uh, the impacts to the public interest. We did that. Next slide. And next, next please. You can see here on the slides and these will be in the materials uh, what it is the departments to report on. Uh, next slide, please. 
And our report found that th this proposal to substantially privatize these public uh, lake bed grant areas was not consistent with protecting and enhancing a public trust purpose. Um, the private uses of it were neither minor nor incidental. Uh, the loss of the public trust uses in these areas would outweigh any potential enhancement that would come from the proposal. It's not consistent with the public <clears throat> trust duty and authority. And there were no restrictions to make sure uh, that the lake bed would only be used for public purposes. In fact, the proposal was to introduce substantial private purposes. And we did not feel that was within the allowable scope of uh, public trust uses of the area. So uh, we're gonna skip over the couture. Next slide, please. Next slide. <laughs> Uh, current issues, what we're seeing in Milwaukee um, is a development boom. You see a number of developments uh, proposed up and down the rivers. Uh, some of that uh, older property that's sat vacant or underused for years uh, starts to look like absolutely prime real estate. And we've seen a number of developments on the river. Uh, there, we're primarily looking to make sure that uh, water quality is protected. We're not seeing substantial intrusions into the river and that the river walk is in place to make sure that the public's got appropriate access. Um, we're seeing substantial developments in the harbor as well. There, we're trying to make sure that the harbor is used for appropriate harbor purposes, and uh, the harbor board of harbor commissioners and the, the, the port uh, definitely are attuned to the public trust issues and make sure that uh, there is uh, a valid commercial navigational purpose for the projects they put out there. And we're seeing public, uh, uh, you know, to tie into the next presenter, we're seeing uh, challenges presently with the fiscal pressure, pressures that are put on public entities. You have substantial reservations of public space, primarily parkland or other public amenities. And the question now becomes, how do we have enough money to maintain those or to provide those public amenities going forward? We've seen that with Milwaukee County Parks. Uh, the Milwaukee County Parks has a substantial responsibility for lake bed grant areas throughout the city. And you also saw that with the city of Racine. They've got a lot of land uh, that's dedicated to public park purposes and a real trouble, you know, from their own tax base as it stands today, maintaining that or providing uh, substantial new public amenities. So I'll stop there and turn it over uh, to the next presenter, but we'll be available for questions if there's anything anybody wants to talk about at the end. Thank, Thank you. you, Michael. Uh, we are, we now have Brenda Coley who's joined us. So we are going to go to her presentation. Uh, she's the co-executive director of Milwaukee Water Commons, and she's going to be discussing public access to the lakefront, Milwaukee's lakefront, especially access for marginalized communities and the general community's interest in use and access. So Brenda, please take it away. Thank you, Melissa, for having me. Um, I'm waiting for my slides to come up. No worries. I have us all out of whack here. So uh, as uh, Melissa said, I am the co-executive director of Milwaukee Water Commons. Next slide, please. And a little bit about who we are. We are cross-country, cross-city network that fosters communication, connection, collaboration, and broad uh, community leadership on behalf of our waters. What we do is we promote stewardship of equitable access to and shared decision-making for our common waters. Next slide, please. And we have a vision that Milwaukee is a model water city where we all have a stake and a say in the health of our waters and all share in the care and the benefits. Next slide, please. Uh, from that vision, we uh, have a water city agenda, community vetted division, uh, vision of Milwaukee and we have six initiatives that are part of that agenda and they're blue green jobs, water quality, drinking water, arts and culture, education and recreation and green infrastructure and we uh, uh, developed this um, presentation, this uh, agenda in 2016. Next slide please. Uh, we organized uh, 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 several frameworks, environmental justice, uh, collective impact, the commons and community engagement. And there's probably two things that I'm gonna speak about today, unpack a little bit is environmental justice and the commons. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, just a little bit about our EJ policy. We um, uh, host an environmental justice roundtable. We are in partnership with uh, MMSD and facilitated water equity task force is looking at uh, blue green jobs. We have an urban tree canopy renewal uh, in Sherman Park. We sit on the governor's task force in climate change. We're on the Wisconsin climate table and regionally 
We're a part of Healing Our Waters, which is a um, Great Lakes um, um, advocate organization, coalition, and then the Midwest Environmental Justice Network. Next slide, please. Um, sorry, next slide. Um, our understanding of the commons is as a cultural and natural resources accessible to all members of society. You know, in the commons are air, land and water and a habitable earth. And these things, as we are talking about today, are held, held in common, not owned privately. Uh, we believe that um, the society is made up of um, uh, three parts, the market, which is our economic system, the government, which holds the commons and trust for the, for the people, and commons, which is the stuff I talked about above. And um, really, you know, we, we're talking about today about the DNR really being our gatekeeper around those issues around the commons and lake beds and river beds. Uh, next slide, please. You know, environmental justice, I just wanna say is complex, but it is place-based at the same time. It's not universally defined, um, links environmental, really sustainability with social justice. Uh, definition is place, time, and perspective. Um, often explain examples of environmental injustices. And we really believe that the healthy environment and wellness are respected for all people and future generations, regardless of identity. And for us, that's really what environmental justice means. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we wanna unpack some of these notions of justice for our wider ways, better understand and apply the concept of EJ, um, helpful for us to really reflect on what EJ requires in a given situation to achieve justice and applying principles of justice and fairness when we're talking about these um, lake beds and, and, um, and river beds. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so here I'm just going to unpack our understanding of uh, the public trust doctrine so that we're all on the page, the same page. Uh, the state of Wisconsin holds all navigable waters in trust for the people of Wisconsin. This is a role of the government to hold the commons in trust for us. And it, it, to us, it's a value, not a matter of politics. Next slide, please. Um, and when we apply environmental justice to the public trust doctrine, we understand this as, as an equitable access to use and enjoyment of our environmental resources and nature for all people in all parts of the population. Next slide, please. Um, I won't unpack this, but we look at environmental justice through these three components on uh, distributive justice, procedural justice, and restorative justice. So it's, uh, we, we use this to look at it. Is it distributed fairly? Um, does, the, does the public trust doctrine, which includes lake beds, really have full access? Um, do we have, you know, is there enough community engagement? And do we mediate the harms that have done that have been wrongly done? So these are the ways that we're looking at environmental justice. Um, next slide, please. Uh, what we believe to be true, you know, as we've been talking about, due to the significant value of lakefront lands, developers have sought time after time to commercially develop them. Um, but we believe that private rights are subject to pre-existing public rights. We believe that public uh, restaurants, destination restaurants are really un incompatible under the public trust doctrine. And we object to the de development of these restaurants on the lake beds and river beds in our city. Uh, next slide, please. You know, access to recreation for all people must be understood as a public good and service. Um, inequality and wider access in Milwaukee are, are intrinsically linked. You know, Milwaukee is a hyper super segregated city, but one of the few places where you will see multicultural and multiracial gatherings where people mingle with each other is on the lakefront and on our riverbeds. And so the generally destination restaurants expand and make the surrounding areas look private. Even if they're not private, they look private. And so they're not accessible to the, uh, to the, to the public. So these are, some of the serious issues that we want um, our government to consider uh, around these destination restaurants, which we feel is in incompatible with the public trust doctrine. You know, we want the public trust to, pro it provides a framework to reorientate our understanding of human built waterways and how we should pay for their upkeep. But I understand and um, 
through talks with the county and what the last speaker said, that there is pressure and tension, especially with the county regarding how they're going to pay for upkeep uh, of these uh, areas. You know, but we see, as, as we've said, lake beds as a public commons. Next slide, please. Um, that's the end of my um, presentation. I'm really um, um, appreciative to be invited to speak to, uh, with you about this. And um, thank you for your interest in, uh, in this issue. Thank you so much, Brenda. We're now going to Tony Herkert. She's the Government Affairs Director for the League of Wisconsin Municipalities. And she'll be discussing the statewide perspective on municipalities that are managing these lake bed grants and possible new opportunities with federal infrastructure funding. So Tony, please take it away. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for having me here today. I appreciate the opportunity to address the audience. Um, the presentations so far have been fabulous. Uh, I am Tony Herkert, Government Affairs Director at the League of Wisconsin Municipality. I've been with the League for about a year now. Um, it went by fast and furious, that's for sure. Um, next slide, please. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about um, municipalities and municipal pressures on, um, or the balancing act on um, public lands. So parks, um, beaches, all the different facilities that we have to manage from a municipal standpoint and how that kind of ties in with the public trust doctrine, but also um, the issues that come before boards and councils um, and mayors and village presidents, um, you know, continuously about how to manage uh, those properties. So as we know, Wisconsin has over a thousand miles of uh, Great Lakes Coast on Lake Michigan and Lake Superior, and that includes 21 um, unique harbor communities uh, on the Great Lakes, cities and villages on the Great Lakes, so municipalities um, on those Great Lakes, and, and those are listed below. So I'm not just focusing on Milwaukee, I'm kind of looking at the whole um, Great Lakes coastal community. Uh, next slide, please. So the Municipal Juggling Act, um, uh, as I like to call it, it happens each year when we're doing annual budgeting and we look at the host of um, services that we have to provide our residents. And, and let me tell you, any one of these services can seem small and any one can seem very, very big to any particular group. So look at maintenance of cemeteries. If we would try to cut um, the amount of time, energy, resources we spend municipally caring for our cemeteries, there is going to be a big uprising of individuals who, you know, care passionately and deeply about the care and maintenance of that cemetery. So each year when we're doing our budgeting, we're trying to take into consideration all these different elements of, of municipal life and community that really impact our residents. And everybody is passionate about something or things. So it really does become a difficult juggling act when we're trying to provide residents with vital, but yet still cost-effective services. Um, you know, a couple that highlight on, on here are, you know, transit, maintenance of roads and, and building new roads or, or paving roads, um, snow removal, making sure you know, garbage is collected on time, public safety, whether that's ambulance, EMTs, um, police or fire, all of those things you know, can be competing interests in a municipality, um, especially as we're strapped with uh, revenues that are not necessarily increasing. Next slide, please. So all of the services, as I mentioned on the slide before, compete for an ever shrinking pot of municipal funding. 
Shared revenue, which is our state aid from the state of Wisconsin, has decreased steadily over the last two decades, um, falling 94 million, while the costs of services that we have to provide to our residents are continually increasing, not only at a rate of inflation, but also at a rate of need or want from residents in our communities as those communities transition um, or move into a new you know, era of, you know, young, the younger generation, the millennials are requesting different things than the baby boomers did. Um, and somehow a municipality and towns struggle with this as well, have to keep up with those changing needs. We're also under the strictest levy limits in the nation where we do not grow by inflation. We grow by net new construction. And that means any new construction in in a city or village, that cost associated with that can be levied as additional property tax, but you also have to exclude from that cost of net new construction any demolishing or remediation that had to be done to prepare a site for new development. So in a lot of our older communities that have been developed for a long time, we don't really have expanding true new construction. We have redevelopment. And that redevelopment comes with significant costs in and of itself that have to be subtracted from any net new um, proceeds. Uh, we also have a municipal services program in the state, which is kind of a pilot payment. So a payment in lieu of taxes for any tax exempt properties that um, I believe was around 21 million a couple years ago. It's down to about 18.5 million, and it only pays for about 30% of our um, costs associated with servicing those tax exempt properties. In addition, our road aids that we receive from the state um, are paying for about 16 to 17% of our road costs. Um, in municipalities where towns sit upwards of 80, 90% of their road costs. Well, they can qualify for 80 to 90%. They're up around 36% total road costs are paid for. So again, municipalities are just significantly under um, revenue restraints, I would say, whether it's growth in our new revenue or what we're getting from the state. Um, or how we're allowed to raise our own funding. Next slide, please. So these public spaces that we all care about and are passionate about and really create, you know, that sense of community that we're looking for um, in our, our local homes and, and areas, whether it be a community center or a senior center or a museum or a park, uh, public walkway, a beach, those are all important elements of community. And they all compete with public safety and roads for funding on what we now understand is a very tight municipal budget. Next slide, please. So some help for municipalities. Um, competing interests for municipal and frankly state funding has given rise to increased dependence on friends groups. We see it all the time in our local parks, our state parks, our county parks, volunteers who help clean up beaches, um, remove garbage, uh, place signs, uh, and then public and private partnerships think naming rights um, where municipalities may be able to garner some funding associated um, with public spaces uh, without compromising the public trust. And then grant funding to maintain parks and other public places that municipalities are held responsible for. Keep in mind that grant funds do not cover the ongoing maintenance, policing, garbage collection, et cetera, of those public spaces. And public spaces are tax exempt, which decreases our overall municipal tax collections. And as we decrease tax collections, those amounts of services or the funding to pay for those services have to come from somewhere, which means other classes you know, could see their property taxes increase, whether that's residential, commercial, or industrial. Next slide, please. 
So a couple of ways in which municipalities have sought some help um, in areas associated with public spaces are stewardship grants. Um, we have a specific category, local unit of government or the LUG grant from DNR. Some drawbacks are the applications are only accepted once per year. They require a 50% match. It's super competitive, um, three times more applications than there are available funds. And then the legislative review body, the Joint Finance Committee has become more um, objection related as they scrutinize projects and the costs associated with those projects. We were able to secure additional funding this budget um, the LUG program was the only one that saw an overall large increase in stewardship, and that was $3 million. Next slide, please. I'll try to go through this quickly. Coastal management grants, there are uh, 1.5 million available for some habitat protection, restoration, non-point source controls, coastal and resource community planning, and then access and historic preservation. Next slide. Um, just some more information about coastal management, they require in kind or they require matching of non federal funds and they may be in kind next slide. Great Lakes uh, restoration initiative funding there's a billion dollars in the new infrastructure act over five years, uh, $10 million for Great Lakes habitat restoration grants program for 2022 actually closes today, so hopefully some communities applied for that. Uh, next slide please. American Rescue Plan funds. So there is up to $10 million dependent on the municipality's actual ARPA distribution that can be spent on government services, which could include things like maintenance of park properties and public space areas. Also in disproportionately impacted communities, Treasury has allowed the use of ARPA funds outside of that government service category to um, help with improved health outcomes and public safety in areas for parks, recreation facilities, and programs that increase access to healthy foods are all eligible um, expenditures of ARPA funds in disproportionately impacted communities after Treasury released their final rule. Next slide, please. Federal Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Billion dollars in GLRI again, 700 million annually for five years under FEMA's flood mitigation assistance program, which could help with some of the structural damage, especially on the Great Lakes. Increases funding for the National Coastal Resilience Program annually up to 98 million annual uh, uh, funding for the next five years. Next slide, please. 58 million annually for five years for coastal and estuary land conservation program, 15 million annually for five years for EPA to distribute to land grant universities, which includes UW Madison, but also affiliated research universities at UW Stevens Point and UW Milwaukee. Next slide, please. 400 million for grants to states and tribes for ecosystem restoration projects on private or public lands. Um, 100 million annually for five years to provide local units of government funding for hazard mitigation, um, revolving loan programs, that'll be a new program. All of these we have to wait to get directive from the federal government, either DOT, Department of Energy, Department of Interior on how these programs will roll out. Next slide, please. Questions. So um, we'll obviously all be available for questions after uh, the panel concludes. But if you would have any additional questions, my contact information is attached there. Thank you, Melissa, and thank you everybody for your time. Thank you, uh, that was fascinating. Okay, the last speaker is Sarah Martinez. She's a water policy specialist at the Center for Water Policy, and she'll be discussing the EPA designated Milwaukee Estuary Area of Concern, new lake bed fill issues with the proposed dredged material management facility and how the case law applies to that facility. Uh, Sarah, you're up. All right, afternoon, everyone. Um, as Melissa said, I am Sarah. Marilyn, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so today I'm just gonna cover a couple of things. First, we'll go over some definitions. Um, then I'm gonna walk through the Milwaukee Estuary Area of Concern, what an area of concern is and why this particular area is an area of concern. Uh, third, I'll talk about the proposed use of lake bed east of Jones Island. Then I'll talk about lake bed grants, what they are and why they matter here. 
And finally, I'll wrap it all up in a nice bow and explain um, what all these moving parts mean for this proposed uh, dredged material management facility um, or DMMF in light of the public trust doctrine. Next slide. So really quick, you've heard these terms um, both from Michael Kolakowski and Michael Kane. A lake bed grant is just a legislative grant to a city or similar entity um, to develop lake bed for certain uses. And the public trust doctrine um, kind of overlays that and it protects Wisconsinites rights to fishing, recreation, enjoyment of scenic beauty, navigation, water quality, water-based commerce, and it applies to lake bed in navigable water. Next slide. So what is an area of concern, right? An area, uh, this is an area designated by the EPA where there is significant impairment of beneficial use as the result of human activities at the local level. And to get an idea of what, of the size of this area, let me set the stage. So what you're looking at on your screen in yellow are the three rivers that run through Milwaukee. And the area of concern encompasses 3.1 miles of the Milwaukee River, three miles of the Menominee, and 2.5 of the Kinnikinnick, as well as the inner and outer harbor and near shore waters of Lake, shore, of Lake Michigan. Um, in 2008, this was expanded. Um, and you can see that on your map as it goes just a little bit further. Then to get a sense for how much pollution costs to clean up, consider this. Um, Tony referenced the Great Lakes Restoration in Initiative or the GLRI. And it's a fund dedicated to strategically targeting the biggest threats on um, the Great Lakes. And so over the past five years, the GLRI provided $15.8 million towards this cleanup. Um, and according to MMSD, in total, with funding from both federal, state, and nonprofit partners, the Milwaukee Estuary, Estuary Area of Concern cleanup will cost roughly $200 million to complete. Next slide. So as part of the cleanup process, the Army Corps are partnering with the Wisconsin DNR, MMSD, and other stakeholders will dredge the waterways, um, which is essentially just collecting and removing sediment from the bottom of the water body. And this new proposed DMMF facility um, will be right there in the blue trapezoid on your screen, um, will house the sediment contaminated with PCBs, PAHs, and other heavy metals. Um, both PAHs and PCBs are known carcinogenic um, and it's proposed to be right here. As the project progresses though, um, there are a couple of outstanding issues with how it plans to satisfy the public trust doctrine. Next slide, thank you. Um, it's important before we jump into the analysis um, to know a couple of things. And so let's just start with the port. The port is anticipated to manage the proposed facility in perpetuity if it's constructed. Um, the port is a department within the city of Milwaukee, and its mission is to increase international trade, business development, job creation, and public access to the waterfront. Um, their website emphasizes the importance of the role that they play in maintaining Milwaukee as a water-centric city by supporting water-based commerce, recreation, and leisure. Next slide. The next important thing to know is that there are two ways to develop lake bed. One of these is the lake bed grants that you've already heard about today. Places like Summerfest, Lakeshore State Park, and Bradford Beach are all built on lake bed fill. And historically, these spaces have been used to expand public access to Lake Michigan. Next slide. Thank you. Um, specific lake bed grants. So the land the proposed facility might be on was granted to the city of Milwaukee from the state starting in 1909 and was then amended twice, once in 1923 and again in 1931. The grantees of lake bed grants are limited to the purposes in those grants and then is overlaid with that um, the public trust doctrine. So the grants at issue here were for harbor purposes, uh, in aid of navigation, to construct dock and war facilities. So essentially the granted bed where the proposed facility would be um, is stipulated for just generally hard purposes, but the grant also allows for quote, any other purpose under the public trust doctrine. Next slide. So an additional layer here is that there are several key cases to bear in mind as we move through um, understanding why certain things are and are not allowed on lake bed. The defining case in this arena was Illinois Central. And in this case, when a railway company wanted to develop lake bed to expand their operation, the US Supreme Court said no, because this use violated the public trust. So essentially the court limited grants of trust property to those who would only promote the public trust interest in some way. Then in city of Milwaukee, when the state granted Illinois Steel Company use for, of lake bed for construction of the city's outer harbor, 
the Wisconsin Supreme Court held that so long as the proposed use of lake bed aids public trust purposes, the use is consistent with the public trust doctrine. And in Wisconsin, this has come to mean that uses for lake bed given by lake bed grant must meet a six factor test laid out across two cases, Public Service Commission and City of Madison. Next slide. In these two cases, the court explained that so long as public bodies control use of the area, the area is devoted to public purposes and open to the public, diminution of lake would be small when compared to the of the lake. Um, if any of the uses would be greatly destroyed or um, whether impairment of the rights is negligible um, and the use of lake bed fill should not be for solely a local purpose. Um, if, if it met the six factor test, then the project on lake bed would satisfy the public trust doctrine. Um, note for the six factor that there's not been any further litigation to my knowledge of what is quote unquote too local. Um, although it suggested that local is equated to public access. So if a pr proposed use is open to the public, it is not so local to be an improper use under the public trust. Next slide. Sorry, thank you. Um, of those six factors, let's go ahead and apply it to the proposed facility here. And let's start the analysis with what we know. So first, obviously the project meets the first factor because the port will be the one to manage the facility in perpetuity and it's a public body. Um, second, the project requires uh, an understanding of the current uses uh, of the proposed space to be filled and an evaluation of how the DMMF facility will affect those uses. So if the evaluation focuses on the whole of Lake Michigan, then this prong is satisfied. So now let's turn to what is currently up in the air. Uh, so will it be used for public purposes and open to the public? Uh, maybe, we, we don't know yet. It could go several, several ways. Um, a landfill created to host contaminated sediment as part of a cleanup process could be seen as a per public purpose, um, but there are no cases to support this contention. Um, and then also in past agency guidance, there is a list which includes a CDF, which is the same thing as the DMF, um, as a permiss permissible use of lake bed, but it does stipulate that it still has to meet the public trust doctrine and other Supreme Court guidelines. Next slide. Focusing on the fourth factor, it's also a coin toss as to which way the analysis might swing. Um, it's simpler to what it's similar to what I said. Uh, if the evaluation focuses on the discrete proposed DMMF site, the effect might be um, higher when compared to evaluating the site against the whole of Lake Michigan, which spans roughly 22,000 square miles. Um, next, the current location for the proposed DMMF hosts several recreational activities like fishing, boating, and sailing. Um, and while it's been said in the past that Lake Michigan was naturally um, designed to serve com commercial purposes, that simply is not the whole story. Uh, these recreational activities are also worth protecting and promoting. Um, and another thing to note is that the design life of this facility is only 100 years. And in light of climate change, um, we need to be much more futuristic than that. A design life of 100 years poses the risk of leaching um, for future generations to deal with. So this prong depends um, on whether stakeholders can make an assertive effort to preserve recreational uses and increase longevity of the facility. Finally, we will use, uh, will use of the lake bed fill be solely for a local purpose? Well, again, precedent suggests that this prong can be met by installing parks and expanding public access and ability to exercise public rights. Without a determination ahead of time though, it's really difficult to assess whether stakeholders can meet this prong. Next slide. So with all of this in mind, um, I just wanna pose a question. Uh, are public decision makers meeting with the community to assess this as an opportunity to expand public rights in Lake Michigan? And I believe there are a few ways that stakeholders can make this happen. So first, uh, the WDNR should support a process that engages the community to weigh in on final uses of the newly created land. Um, stakeholders should clearly identify the final disposition of land prior to approval, consistent with the six-factor test, so that WDNR can accurately assess the project's compliance with both the city's lake bed grants and the public trust doctrine. Um, and then lastly, considering climate impacts, uh, I believe that designers of the DMMF should explore more future looking designs to increase longevity of its lifespan and prevent adverse water quality impacts. Um, and then also, so that's the end of my presentation, but I just wanted to note that I have published a policy brief on this issue and it is out on the Center for Water Policy's uh, website today. So thank you so much, everyone. I will turn it back over to Melissa. 
Thank you, Sarah. That was terrific. Uh, so now we're going to open it up to questions. And it looks like a lot of them have been rolling in throughout the panelists' presentations. So great to see all of the interesting questions out there. I am going to start with one from Jennifer Westernhauser. Uh, this is for the panel generally asking, has increasing shoreline and wave erosion due to climate impacts resulted in any concerns about construction projects on these lake bed areas or hesitancy in pursuing them? Well, I think I can take a shot at that one. Uh, in the past few years, we've seen uh, incredibly high Great Lakes water levels, which has uh, just battered the shoreline up and down. Um, not just public areas, but private homes as well. Some of you may have caught the news coverage of uh, homes further south in Milwaukee essentially hanging over the bluff as it erodes away. And so I do think that uh, erosion and erosion control on the Great Lakes is a significant concern for public areas, uh, particularly where you're talking about you know, limited resources to uh, in these areas. Uh, what we do see is a lot of uh, municipal projects that are aimed at shoreline protection where they have these public areas. One of the common ways to accomplish that is through riprap, which is essentially large rock protection that's going to dissipate that wave energy and protect the shoreline, keep the keep the land where it's at. And then for others, if you're more interested in um, you know, sort of a, a more natural solution. There's a project at Kenosha Dunes, which is a beach nourishment, uh, which is essentially placing sand back in front of the land um, in an effort to more naturally um, stabilize and sort of rehabilitate that area that's eroded away. Um, tough to tell how climate change will impact this because the Great Lakes fluctuate uh, fairly predictably uh, on a cycle. They go to, uh, to highs and lows. What we've seen lately is is, uh, an extreme high recently uh, uh, coming right after an extreme low. How climate change will affect that is yet to be determined, and that's going to be determined on the basis of uh, precipitation, uh, ice freeze in the winter, uh, things, things of that nature. But the lake levels control and climate can certainly have an impact on how those lake levels fluctuate. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is from John Stoll. He asks, is there an opportunity for state tourism and economic development funding to be used for ongoing maintenance of public trust areas in municipal areas that are significant draws for visitors uh, for public use? And could this be an ongoing consistent source of funds from outside local communities? I think this one's probably for you, Tony. I think, um, first of all, John, that's a great recommendation. And um, I think logically it would make sense from a tourism standpoint to help um, municipalities safeguard those public trust lands or, um, you know, public park areas. However, it, it's been kind of said in the past that those lands are even though protected by the public trust from the state, they're kind of the municipality's, um, you know, kind of ward at this point, and that that protection, maintenance, whatnot, and so forth, you know, has to come from the municipality. Um, if we could make some inroads on tourism dollars, um, that would that would be fabulous. Thank you. Uh, did anyone else have an answer for that? All right. Um, there's a question here from Michael Tim about the status of the dry dock on the Kinnikinick River just downstream of First Street. This is a very specific location. So I don't know if anyone on the panel knows about this project. I do. That one will be for me as well. Um, I am familiar with this this uh, structure that's uh, essentially a floating barge in the Kinnikinnick River, um, and it is uh, out there, not anchored to the bed, but in public waters. And I think it's important to remember that um, it's it's not just the beds of the waters, but the waters themselves that are held in trust for the public. Um, and that that's not a public use out there. Um, I will say that the department is aware of that particular structure, 
Uh, it does not have a permit from the department, but any structure in navigable waters, whether it's anchored to the bed or not, has to be consistent with the public interest. Um, and the department will uh, has not, but will need to make an evaluation of that. It's also important to remember that an additional component of the public trust is the original component, and that's the um, in aid of commercial navigation. So we talked a lot today about public access to the waterways um, and public uh, use of areas of field land. Um, the public trust also protects uh, the commercial navigational aspects. And so the things that will be looked at with a structure like that are going to be is the project detrimental to the public interest through impacts to water quality, to the fisheries, public recreation? Does it constitute a material obstruction in navigation? Um, and is it a permissible public trust use within those public waters? Um, I'll, I'll also pivot then, Michael, to the rest of your question. Whose job is it to be a watchdog for public trust issues within the government? And I would say that's primarily DNR's responsibility, being delegated um, substantial authority for implementation of public trust, and it's the programs I work with. The Waterways and Wetlands Program um, is responsible both for permitting, which every permit that we issue has a judgment of whether a project is detrimental to the public interest, and through that enforcement component. Um, that said, we are not alone in that. Um, municipalities are going to have a responsibility for maintaining compliance with the public trust, uh, particularly where they have lake bed grant areas, and private citizens also play a role and have the ability to enforce the public trust doctrine in Wisconsin as well. All right, thank you. Uh, let's switch to talking about another specific question. Um, the McKinley Yacht Club and the South Shore Yacht Club. This is a, a question from Jack Suter. Uh, both of those yacht clubs maintain exclusive access to certain prime areas on the shoreline. And I, it appears to be a question about how that's consistent with the public trust doctrine, that exclusive access piece. Well, I can, uh, I can start um, since um, I was at the department uh, before Michael Kolakowski, but um, that has, those have continually been brought to the department's uh, attention when I was there. And um, as John Gerda's slide showed, the Milwaukee Yacht Club um, structure was built, um, you know, many, many decades ago. Um, and the state of Wisconsin, to my knowledge, has not taken enforcement action. They are obviously related to navigation, but I think there is a, a significant question whether it's appropriate um, that those uh, private facilities be located at, at those locations. But, um, you know, during my tenure, the state decided, um, you know, not to take enforcement action. Uh, I suspect that Michael Kolakowski has a plateful and may, may want to add to this, but um, that's my response. Yeah, I'll, I'll just speak to sort of our enforcement priorities, um, much like with the Harbor House pieces of eight, where we see uses that have been established, uh, you know, some 75 years before the creation of DNR. Um, in that, in the case of um, the yacht clubs and, you know, right consistent with the creation of the agency itself with the Harbor House pieces of eight, um, it typically is going to be a little bit lower on our enforcement priority. Uh, those established uses tend to get uh, pretty positive treatment, you know, from, from reviewing courts. If uh, we have uh, an enforcement situation we're trying to prosecute, we're going to have to prove, we're going to have a burden of proof that uh, there is indeed a violation and a court's likely to take into account equitable factors, like the length of time it's been there. So I think uh, historically there's not, not been an appetite to really raise an issue with some of those facilities. But I, I do think as Michael Kane acknowledges, um, you can have questions like that because they don't seem um, to jive with how we've seen the public trust implemented elsewhere. And I think, um, I guess I'll add that uh, since the development of the Department of Natural Resources, uh, I think the state has been much more vigilant of these sorts of developments, as, as Michael and my presentations have pointed out. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, next, let's go to Paul La Liberté. I hope I didn't just ruin your last name there. Um, he says, where I live in Eau Claire, the key to redeveloping riverfront property is private public partnerships that finance parkland development to an extent that otherwise could not happen. Would this be prohibited if the property was determined to be a public trust parcel 
and some portion of it would be made private. Well, I can, I can take a run at that one. Um, in Eau Claire, we're talking about primarily the Chippewa River. Um, and the Chippewa River does not have the history of manipulation in the way Milwaukee's rivers do. And so we see less of public trust issues arising there um, with filling of the riverbed, things of that nature. Um, I think we, where you do encounter public trust issues, if you have filled land, that can certainly be an issue that can get in the way of what a municipality might want to do with a public-private sort of partnership development, because it may control where exactly elements that public private uh, balance can sit. Um, it would have to be evaluated on its facts and circumstances, but each municipality, um, you know, I, I think has a lot of opportunity to do these sorts of public-private partnerships, and it, it is easiest from a legal perspective to make those happen on land that's not subject to the public trust, but just adjacent to navigable waters. Sometimes that comes available for communities, um, you know, through, through, uh, remediation of brownfield sites. Um, and we, we see appropriate you know, public-private partnerships and, and those uses in the right space where we find uh, substantial fill um, in harbor areas, uh, particularly, it becomes much more challenging and, and can interrupt what a municipality might wanna do. Thank you. Tony, did you wanna add something? I was gonna say, Melissa, I would just add that um, because I think John pointed out pretty well that uh, our development has been heavily around in and around industrial areas and that many of you know the filled lands on the Great Lakes can be blighted or contaminated and those are kind of left for municipalities um, to deal with. So we are running into situations in municipalities where we do have contaminated properties where a current owner is no longer evident wants to sell whatever and the municipality um, it has a difficult time taking a hold of those parcels due to the contamination and not having any ability to remediate and then not knowing whether they would be able to proceed with a public private partnership to help with the contamination and the remediation in a brownfields type redevelopment like um, Mike mentioned. Um, so, so it's it's difficult for municipalities to proceed um, in some of these areas. And overall, I would say it's probably in the public interest to remove contamination from our lake shores, e even if that means venturing into a public-private partnership. Um, and I know that you know takes into consideration the public trust, but in order to make some of these uh, contaminated lands able to be turned over into something more beneficial for the community, um, we may have to take steps in, in that direction. All right, thank you. Oh boy, we have so many questions rolling in. I'm sorry we won't be able to reach all of them. Uh, let's, why don't we take another um, live topic? Does, this is from Dennis Grzynski. Does either Michael know anything about the private bar restaurant that Milwaukee County has approved for part of Bradford Beach bathhouse? And um, that might also be one for Brenda to, to opine on. And then we'll have to wrap it up. Um, perhaps I can start um, because um, that's one of the issues that was brought to Greenfire's attention and which gave rise to the joint letter that was submitted with uh, Brenda Coley and others um, to the state of Wisconsin, the Department of Natural Resources, the Attorney General in Milwaukee County, uh, because we were concerned uh, that the, <clears throat> the Bradford Beach facilities were moving toward more of a private restaurant bar and excluding the public. Um, and um, the Green Fire received lots of calls from citizens, and we have conveyed those to the department, to the Milwaukee County, and to the Department of Natural Resources. And so it's an ongoing issue. And I think that the department has uh, has taken steps, and they're working with Milwaukee County. Um, I think that the the issues are yet to be resolved, um, and, and I think there's a lot of work to be done before the uh, the beach season starts. Um, so I'll turn it over to you, Michael or Brenda. 
Sure. So the department's been engaged on that bathhouse project at Bradford Beach. And, you know, it's our position that a private restaurant on that Lake Bed Grant area is not a permissible use of the uh, of the Lake Bed Grant consistent with the public trust. Now, concessions that serve a public amenity like Bradford Beach are allowable. And it really becomes an analysis of the matter of degree uh, in terms of what you have out there. Is it simply a concession which is serving people who would otherwise come to the beach to recreate? Or is it a private destination restaurant that's a draw in and of, in and of itself? So we were really active um, both with Milwaukee County and through the Lakefront Development Advisory Committee um, to make it known that we didn't feel that a private restaurant, should it turn out to be that out of the proposal was an acceptable use of that grant area. Um, part of the, uh, the aspects that we're gonna focus on is that is that area open to the public? Is it um, you know, an exclusive restaurant where you need to go and buy a meal to be able to sit um, on that building or at that building on the public space? Or is it open to the public to go and you know, bring their lunch or bring their beverages and enjoy it as well? Um, you know, when's it gonna be closed to the public? What is the actual service that makes this a, which is allowable versus a private destination restaurant? I've been informed that uh, the expansion onto the roof of the bathhouse is not contemplated for this summer, but like with all public trust issues, you know, it's, it's that preservation side of things where something has not occurred. There's always the potential that we'll see another proposal, either similar or one step further in the future. And so it, it's our responsibility at DNR uh, to enforce the terms of lake bed grants and make sure Milwaukee County is going to comply with that, and, uh, keep areas open to the public that need to be. Thank you. I, um, I, I think what Michael Kane and Michael uh, Kolowski has outlined is really um, the, the issues at hand. And I really do appreciate the fact that the DNR is seeing this in, in this way, that they're really being the trust keepers for this land. The issue is, is that these exclusive destination restaurants, you know, they generally expand in the area, either on the side or in front of the area that they're at. I know that, that that rooftop was going to be exclusive. You had to be a member in order to, to, to uh, access that space. And that is just totally against what we're, what we're talking about with, with uh, community uh, engagement and community participation. So it becomes a, a, an elite isolated space on our public lands that, um, that uh, we don't have access to. It's prime real estate, we understand that. And I understand the concerns that the county has, but there's gotta be another way, you know? So this is really not compatible uh, with uh, the public trust doctrine. And, and I think it's just uh, a wrong way to figure out how to resolve our problems, you know, that, that, that are there. All right, thank you. Well, we are out of time. Um, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, Wisconsin's Green Fire and the Environmental Law Section of the State Bar of Wisconsin. I'd like to thank our panelists for uh, lending their expertise and our audience for your participation in today's educational webinar. We will post a recording on our YouTube channel and website under events. This is on the website for the Center for Water Policy at UW-Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences. Uh, and we have been approved for 1.5 hours of CLE credit. So for the lawyers attending, this is uh, approved credit for you right in time for your reporting deadline. Uh, thanks everyone, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>